fireworks returning, East River and the like here in New York City. But uh, we'll get into a little Mets baseball, get it going. We'll get you all prepared for Mets-Yankees later on tonight where it's Taiwan Walker and Jordan Montgomery are your starters. Afternoon game on Saturday, Garrett Cole. We will get into the Yankees as we spent a lot of time this week talking about the Yankees. Because well, they Cashman, keep holding press conferences. No doubt, with Cashman, with Boone, with obviously Hal Steinbrenner yesterday, Maggie. But last night for the Mets and... You know, tough loss. I mean, and you could probably say bad loss for the Mets is, you know, DeGrom bad early, you know, and, and what I mean by bad is he gave up three runs. The Mets are down three to one. Uh, you know, they don't, he then retires, you know, 18 straight, has 14 strikeouts, finds himself. That's the brilliance of Jacob DeGrom. It, it just is. When you watch him early on and, you know, in the second inning, the Atlanta Braves have hit for the cycle as a team, double, triple, and a home run and a single as well. And you're saying to yourself, uh-oh, here we go. DeGrom able to be wild in the strike zone, find that command, find himself. Those are what the greats do. They really do. When, you know, it, it's, it's, he doesn't implode. He doesn't give you a three-inning or four-inning start. Jacob DeGrom settles down and becomes his usual brilliant Jacob DeGrom self. And it was a winning start. Unfortunately for the Mets is that they don't have any offense. I mean, it's a lot of light hitting, uh, you know, little to no offense whatsoever. They didn't do all that much against Ian Anderson. Dom Smith tried to play hero late hitting the game-tying home run, and then you get to the bottom half of the ninth inning, and, you know, Seth Lugo didn't do his job. You need Lugo to be good there to get yourself into extras, put the men on second, have an opportunity to potentially win it. You know, the Inciarte at bat 0-2 loses them to a walk, and oh. then you get the Freddie Freeman rip up the middle, you know, bounced up in the air, picked up by Guillaume Lugo screaming for him to run to third base to go get, uh, you know, uh, Acuna at third, throws to first, Freeman beats the throw, Braves win the game 4-3, to three. And the Mets suffer a, a loss. And I think we go around and around here when you look at this Met team is, you know, they're still in first place. They haven't played their best baseball. Their pitching has defined them. The defense has been, for the most part, really, really good this year, whether that be the analytics or guys being out of the lineup. The defense has not been an issue. The The consistent drumbeat for the Mets is, when is this offense finally going to wake up, Maggie? When is this offense finally going to do what – carry their weight on this team and do what you expect them to do before the start of the year. I don't know, but they got to wake up because, you know, guys got to start getting hot here. And you worry because everyone told me, you know, June, and I was worried about June. And I'll admit, you know, they go 500 in June, exactly 15 and 15. And so they kept their heads above water and you keep yourself in first place. But one of the big issues that I have with people just saying, oh, the Mets are fine because they're in first place. It's like, why are we scoreboard watching in June? when the other teams in the division have not even begun to play anywhere near their best baseball, the Nationals have come on recently winning like 14 of 17. And my big fear is that maybe you woke up a little bit of a sleeping giant in the Atlanta Braves. I mean, the Atlanta Braves talk about momentum that they could build off of with the last two games of this series. You smack the Mets in the mouth to 20 runs in the second game of the series. And last night, Jacob DeGrom on the mound. And you could even tell a little bit, Moose, like when Jake starts shaking off pitches a little early, you know, that he kind of, I don't know, either was just took a little extra second to find something. The fact that the Adrianza triple, I mean, imagine how things could have changed. The first triple of the game, just starting off the game, that gets overturned on replay. That Guillaume couldn't apply the tag when he does that swim move. Good slide by Adrianza, but maybe that would have been a little bit different. Instead, you know, they put three runs on Jacob DeGrom, and the Mets have to climb out of it the entire night. They finally do. And then, as you said, Seth Lugo, you know, lets Ender Inciarte take a walk, and then Freddie Freeman wins it. I, I just, like, you know, I look at the Braves – and nobody expected them to be this bad, right? And this inconsistent. So what do they have? Pakoda did. Pakoda. And we and we mocked Pakoda. We did. And I the did. joke's on us. Yes. Because now the Braves are playing before the All-Star break, Marlins, Pirates, Marlins. You're back. You're five games back in the loss column, sure. But what does a good week do for you here? You know, this could look very different as we hit the All-Star break as it did heading in. And I always hated that scoreboard watching because the Mets were, A, not playing their best baseball, and two, you know, they couldn't ever apply the pressure when the window opened. The window opened because the rest of the division got off to this really lousy start, and the Mets were, like, the best of the worst. But yet, it was almost like a basketball game when the opponent has, like, all these turnovers and can't hit the ocean from the beach, but the team, other teams only up, like, five points at half. And it's like, man, you just didn't do enough to take care of this team or your opponent, 
and now you've left the door open. That's how I feel. Yeah, but now, it, but don't with, with that narrative. Yeah, don't we have that discussion when you have an underdog? Are the Mets really an underdog when you look at this division? They're their clear betting favorite. They but they're have letting been, people hang around. No, I get it, but I get it. But you brought up kind of the the college basketball or NBA example right. where you know you let a team off the hook, right? right? That's more a case, when I look at it, more of the case of a team that's kind of up against it, underdog, the other team, you had an opportunity, they had a bad half, you should have jumped out, you should have been up double digits. Like, I look at the Mets, Maggie, and I've, I've said it, I know you and I kind of disagree on it to an extent, is I, th- I still think the Mets control what they what they control, what they happens in this division. The pitching is, is real, right? I know they've suffered injuries, positive news yesterday by Rojas about Carrasco. The lineup yeah, but, now. But David I've Peterson given, is going to miss his next. David start. Peterson's going to miss his next start. But positive news about Carrasco. We'll we'll take I'll that take positive. The positive. Right, when, take the positive. You but you have the negative as well. Fair. The lineup though is one that you know I've given them maybe a little bit too much credit here. Maybe the lineup I've given them where I think you know with Conforto and Lindor and McNeil and Alonzo and with Dom Smith and saying well there's too many good bats in this lineup to be as meek as they have been up until this point in time. One of the worst you know, in baseball. I, maybe I've overrated them. I mean, maybe it is. Maybe they're maybe the too much information or the information they're being given now by their hitting coach, you know, Q, uh, Quattlebaum, maybe, you know, that's not resonating with this group right now. Because, or, or maybe teams know how to pitch these guys and they have not made the proper adjustment uh, up at home plate. At some point, uh, you know, Rojas talked about earlier in the week where the, the mini comeback before the big three-run home run this is a sign of our offense, I believe, turning it around. You get the same lackluster at bats night in and night out. I still, though, think that if the Mets play their best, I still think they're the best team in this division. Now, they have not played their best either. You're right about the Nats, who have been hot as a firecrackers of late. You know, maybe the Atlanta Braves now wake up after the victory last night, taking two or three and and beating Jacob DeGrom, Big Bad Jake, and the Mets. Maybe they do, but right up until this point in time, the, the Atlanta Braves have played under 500 baseball. They have not been particularly good. There's a reason why they have not been particularly good. They've struggled a little bit offensively. Their bullpen has also been uh, a disaster. They've suffered injuries in their starting rotation. So I look at the Mets and I say, well, yeah, the Mets have not played their best. They're still in first place in the National League East. And if, I know it's a big if, if this offense ever gets going, they're going to be that much better. Well, I hope you're right. But I also think that the Braves have not been playing to the best of their ability. And just how much confidence do you get off these last two games? I mean, it's it's immeasurable. And this is a team, I think, that's kind of waiting to break out. No, oh, by the way, they took three, two or three, and Acuna wasn't even playing full, all, all three games fully. You know, and, and he's one of their best, if not their best player, who didn't even start yesterday's game. So I just... I felt like the scoreboard watching was always just counting your 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 chickens before they hatch kind of mentality, and I really didn't like it. Now, the one thing that actually makes me very optimistic is the message that's coming from the Mets, which has been said over and over again, whether it's by Zach Scott, who's the acting GM or whatever, which is this is not going to be the team post-July 30th. This is going to be a team that is going to be very, very aggressive at the trade deadline. And now you have to be because whatever has happened with Peterson, even if Carrasco's back, Carrasco's like on the other side of 35 and a guy who, you know, spent all the season down. Like, I love him for his postseason experience, but, you know, he's going to have to, I'm sure, get eased back in and you have to meaningfully add to this rotation. I know it's weird because the offense is the problem. But adding to the rotation is what they must do. And can I add on top of it one other truth about this Major League Baseball season and why I fear waking up the other teams in the division. The wild card is not coming from this from this division. The wild card is coming from the NL West. Right. So you have to win the division. You don't have actually any breathing room. You don't have a safety net. You can't say, well, we could get the wild card. No. San Francisco Giants, LA Dodgers, Padres, those three teams – the, the, the wild cards are coming from somewhere else. And I don't even know what the Chicago Cubs are going to do with the deadline. Do they decide to sell? Do they decide to buy? They're an enigma. I just feel like this is a little bit tightrope without a, without a safety net. They didn't help themselves at all necessarily during this stretch. They have to help themselves at the deadline. And when is the offense going to wake up? I mean, who the hell knows? Your guess is as good as mine. They've scored three runs or fewer in seven of their last 11 games. Well, and you look at it June 16th. 
High water mark, they were 35 and 25. Last 17, they're 6 and 11 in their last 17 not games. Not trending in the right no, direction. They're not, I get they're not trending in the right direction, and they've had some gut-wrenching losses here. And that's what that's what probably gives you a little bit more confidence if you're a Met fan about adding something is because of Steve Cohen no doubt. and what Scott has to say. And, you know, we we talked about the, the positives of having Cohen owning this team with how the quality that this team left spring training with, with the bench Maggie and the backup players. And those guys have had to been called on to, to play a lot of meaningful innings, get a lot of meaningful starts here for Luis Rojas due to injuries a little less more so now, but you know, now that gives you confidence that the Mets are going to, and and I think they will. I mean, and and we could look at maybe you know Barrios or you know going to get an impact starter, whether or not they have the quality of a, a package in order to get that kind of a player. You could also look at this team and say, okay, let's be realistic about the players, the everyday players on this team, and you know Lindor is not going anywhere, right? You look at the lineup last night. I think Pete Alonso. Of the of the you know the eight position players that took the field last night, I think he had the highest batting average at 260. Uh, you know, you, you look at the rest of them; they're they're just not hitting. And you know that goes for you know Dom Smith showed you a little bit of you know with the two solo home runs, but he only has eight home runs on the season. Right. Lindor hasn't given you all that much. McNeil. So I think if we're going to give an honest assessment of looking at this group, yes, we say okay, well, there's a lot of really good hitters. Well, you say well, some of them aren't hitting. What are guys that you look at them with this team where you say, well, those guys are definite keepers. Those guys have to stick around. Lindor, obviously, he's not going anywhere. Alonzo's not going anywhere. You look at Michael Conforto. Yeah, you know, Michael Conforto, since he's come back, he's he's hitting 216. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's not really ripping the cover off the baseball. And this is a huge year for Michael Conforto as he enters free agency next off this next off season, and he's coming off missing a significant portion of the first half with that hamstring injury. Well, and that's the last thing you want, right? We always talk about pressure. Who has more, Lindor because he signed the big contract? Now he's got to live up to it, or Michael Conforto because he's playing for the big contract? And how do guys respond to this? And Luis Rojas, I think it was Rojas, was asked about pressure with Conforto. I think Steve Gelps had a report on this a couple days ago. And it was just that Conforto puts is like a perfectionist, which must be infuriating if you're a baseball player because it's a game based on failure. So yes. how you can be a perfectionist and also succeed in this league would be crippling if you were a perfectionist. But anyway, the idea that he puts so much pressure on himself and he's so, I don't say wound tightly because I don't think it's necessarily that, but he's put so much pressure on himself at all times. You know, if he doesn't start hitting or he doesn't feel as comfortable as he did and you got that contract looming out there and all of this stuff, like, you know, you got to think about these guys and their mentality and where they're at and who's picking each other up. And, I mean, it's you can't expect that the pitching staff is going to be perfect every night. You know, the offense at some point has to come through and win a game for them. I know it's happened here and there, but on the whole, everyone's had to be perfect. And Lugo wasn't perfect last night. May got himself out of a big jam, by the way. Lugo wasn't perfect last night, and they lose the game. And the night before, they got smacked around and got totally humbled. So it's it's tough to leave Atlanta like this, heads hung a little bit. Even if you are in first place, that couldn't have felt great. And now you come back home, and you got the Subway Series waiting for you. Yeah. And another desperate team. 